1 Samuel chapter 30, I would subtitle this uh, chapter, David's Finer Attributes. David's Finer attribu Attributes. And as we're kind of closing out the book here, it's always, you know, we can look back and remember, you know, some of David's, maybe his more prominent attributes that he's known for. Of course, we talked a lot about going through this book, how loyal he was. That he was loyal even to a man that sought to destroy him and Saul. And we talked about the fact that, you know, uh, he was a very fearless individual. You know, he took on the David and he took on the Goli took on Goliath, or the fact that he had a lot of faith. These are some of the broader things that he might be known for, talking about loyalty and, of course, a man being a great man of faith. But I think as we read through this chapter, we can kind of see some things about David that would show his more finer attributes, the, his better qualities that maybe we don't think about quite as much. <clears throat> it says there in verse 1, It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. So if you remember, he got turned away from going to fight with his brethren. You know, the, the, the king of the Philistines, the king of Gath, said, you know, you got to go back. The lords of the Philistines don't want you here. So he goes back and he finds the city that he'd been given, you know, is lit up. It's on fire. And verse 2, and they had taken the women captives and they, they, that were in, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away. So they show up and they say, well, at least there's no bodies here. We know that they were taken away alive, right? The, 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 the goods have been destroyed, the homes are destroyed, but they've taken the people alive. And it says they carried them, and went, uh, carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. And then verse 4, it says, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And of course, you know, every tough guy in the room gets a little uncomfortable when you talk about a man like David weeping. You know, I mean, what's going on here with this? We all know these big, tough guys, they don't cry. You know, it's, uh, and, you know, and every time I read this, I think about, you know, there is that kind of stigma about men, you know, ever showing any kind of emotion. You know, part of our culture, our society, it's always like, you know, you, you got to play the man. You got to, and I'm not saying, you know, men should be crying every time they get a sliver or something like that. You know, I, I, my boy falls and he scrapes his knee and one of the first, and he comes in and crying, you know, and I say, hey, suck it up. You know, that's life. Life's hard. You fall down and you get up, you know, and we help him and things like that. But, you know, we got, we understand that, that they're, that we can't just cry and boo-hoo over every little thing that happens. But look, there's times, there's seasons, there are events that happen in our life that when they happen, you know, sucking it, uh, sucking it up and just keeping it in and bottling it up isn't probably even going to be possible. You know, and, and we try to, you know, me as men, we kind of resist that, you know, nat seem to naturally resist that emotion of weeping and mourning or at least expressing that openly. I mean, this must have been quite the sight with David, you know, and his 600 men that are with him, these warriors, these hardened, uh, you know, veterans of battle that are just taken back by the sight and then they're just weeping and it says until they had no more power to weep you know I, i've had things happen that have you know brought me to a place of weeping but I, I don't know that i've gotten ever gotten to a place where it was just i had no more power to do it i became so faint that i could never go on and here you know david again he's allowing himself to show this emotion you know when it's appropriate and that's one of his finer attributes you know um, he was a tough guy yeah he was very strong no one would doubt that but he also you know, I don't want to say he had like a sensitive side or anything like that, but he didn't have to put on this tough guy persona all the time. He didn't always have to just be this macho individual. You know, he was not a f person that was afraid to maybe show, you know, when things bothered him, you know, through weeping. And I always remember when I first kind of got into church uh, as a young, younger man, you know, my tw you know, early 20s, I kind of had that attitude, like, you know, I work in this tough field and I don't, you know, we don't cry over things like that. And I remember something had happened in our church some people had left and it was and I remember there was an older gentleman in our church who was very close to these people and we had a meeting and I looked over and he's just I mean tears are just coming down his face you know and he was you know this is a former navy officer this is a very strong individual very respectable man but you know in that moment even a man like that was able to show that emotion and I remember even him making a comment about how you know it was something he considered a sign of maturity is when people are, can, are, are feel comfortable enough to allow that to happen, to allow their emotions to be expressed. And, you know, I can kind of see it now, looking back, what he meant by all that. And we see an example of it here. Big, strong guy like David, all of his warriors, they see this, this, this tragedy happens. You know, their wives and their children. I mean, there's really, I can't really think of a worse fate than that, than having, you know, your family, something happen to your family, you know. 
And it's a very natural reaction to weep. And of course, there's other examples we won't take the time to talk about. You know, how Jesus wept. You know, when, when he went to heal Lazarus, you know, he wept. Uh, Peter wept. You know, and there's many other examples. But I do believe that is one of his finer points, one of his finer attributes that's worth pointing out. You know, we read this chapter. It wasn't just this, this macho, tough guy. He was, you know, able to, uh, you know, show emotion when appropriate. And then, uh, you know, David here, also one of his other attributes is the fact that when he was in that time of trouble, when he was facing that, you know, that anguish and everything, he didn't get bitter. You know, he didn't get angry and resentful. And, and it's, you know, why did God let this happen? And, you know, and people do that. And people, you know, they like to shake their finger at God a lot of times when bad things happen in their life and they blame the Lord. You know, and, 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 and sometimes it's hard to understand why we go through certain things or why things are the way they are or why God allows things or permits things to happen, we have to understand that you'll never know why if, you're, if your first reaction is, you know, why God, why did you do this to me? That's not fair. You know, and just, and just, you know, becoming a bitter, angry individual about it. David is quite the opposite. You know, when this happens and he's in a time of trouble, when he's distressed, you know, he seeks the Lord. He remembers the Lord. It says in verse 6, And David was greatly distressed for the, many peop- for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and every and every uh, for his sons and for his daughters. So they're looking for somebody to blame. Of course, you blame the leader. But David encouraged himself and the Lord his God. You know, he didn't cut out and say, "All oh, these people are going to kill me." You know, thanks a lot, Lord. Why'd you let this happen? I'm out of here. You know, I'll, I'll just ditch these 600 guys and I'm gone. You know, no. It says there that he encouraged himself in the Lord, and that's something that we need to learn to do as God's people. Look. People are, you know, these, and this was, the people that were looking to stone him were not strangers to him. These were men that came to him when he first fled from Saul, that had been loyal to him, that had followed him in the wilderness, and so on and so forth. And now when this, you know, circumstance, this tragedy comes up, they're ready to stone him, you know. And, 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 and it would be real easy for David to just get upset and, and flee and take off, but what does he do rather? He encourages himself in the Lord. He seeks God. And it says, verse 7, And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod, and David inquired of the, at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So he encourages himself in the Lord. He seeks the Lord. And when does he do that? When times are tough, when things are hard, when things are difficult when there's nobody else to encourage himself in. He didn't have anybody else to go to. You know, everybody wants to stone him. So he goes to the one person that will always be there for you, which is the Lord. <clears throat> you know, and he seeks him, and you know, rather than just lashing out or whatever, he seeks the Lord's will. And that's something, if you would go over to Hebrews chapter 4, that you, know, you say, well, I know that. And, and a lot of us know that. A lot of us know the Lord will, you know, he, as he said, you know, I will never leave thee or nor forsake thee. You know, we understand, oh, God's always there. Yeah, I know, I get it, Brother Corbin. Next point, right? But here's the thing about this point, about the fact that God is always there for us, always you know, willing to hear our cry, always willing to help us and listen to us and will never forsake us when all others may. Mm-hmm. You know, we all understand that, but do we often, how often do we take advantage of that? Oh. That's, that's something, that's one of those, those things that we just kind of take for granted a lot of times. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, Humble yourselves therefore in the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. You know, that's something that we're commanded to do. That if we're, we're, if we're caring, you know, if, basically saying if we're worrying, if we're fretting, if we're concerned, if we're distressed in some way, you know, you need to cast that on the Lord. You know, a lot of times people will come to, come to other individuals and say, hey, you know, I've got this problem. And they're not even looking for help. They're just trying to cast it on somebody. Well, you know, they're looking for a sympathetic ear. And I'm not against that. You know, it's good to have a friend that you can go to and talk to and get that counsel. And or people could just, you know, say, yeah, I hear you and understand and kind of share that burden with them. But look, if that's the only person you're going to, you're missing out big time right. on somebody else who can actually do something about it. You know, we go to our friends, we go to our family, we go to our, you know, uh, confidants and we, we talk to them about the things that are going on in life, the struggles that we have. And often they can't do anything about it. Besides, maybe offer a little bit of advice or something like that, or just sympathize, empathize at, at best. But the Lord, you know, when we cast all our care upon Him, not only does He hear us, but He also is the one that can actually move on our behalf. That we can actually, He can actually influence our lives. He actually can move. 
He can actually give us the spiritual strength. He can also give us what we need to make it through that tough time or even change circumstances. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. You know, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He is our high priest in heaven. That's who we have in heaven. It's Jesus Christ today. It's not just that Jesus came and died for our sins and went back to heaven, and now, you know, he's just, he'll, he'll get back to us later. No, he's up in heaven listening. He is our high priest in heaven that we can go to and, and it says in verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You know, maybe some, the reason a lot of people don't go to the Lord is they think, Well, he's God. I don't want to bother him with this. I, you know, this little trouble I'm having. I know this is something that's bothering me. I don't want to take it to him because he's God. He's, not, he's too busy to hear little old me. But the reason why Jesus can is because of the fact that he was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what it's like to be weary. He knows what it's like to be worn down. He knows what it's like to weep and to be sorrowful and to mourn and to have trials and tribulations. Look, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, but he was tempted in all points like as we are. You know, he, he, he knows what it's like to have this flesh, these temptations, these trials, and look, we can go to him. That's who our high priest is, someone who understands our, the feeling of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the, unto the throne of grace. Well, it's just this little problem. I don't want to bother. No, come boldly to the throne of grace, the Bible says. Take it there, and he'll hear you. And that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help when in time of need. You know, when we need God the most, that's when he's going to be there. I mean, he's always there. But when we need God the most, are we taking advantage of that? Are we encouraging ourselves in the Lord? Or are we just trying to duck out of the situation, find somebody else to blame, or just, not, or just get angry and bitter? That's not what David did. And I believe that's a great example in this, this chapter of one of his finer qualities. You know, a lot of people would have reacted differently. Well, this didn't turn out right, you know. I'm here, you know, trying to serve God. You know, I'm trying to do what's right. You know, first it's Saul, now it's the Philistines, and now the, you know, people are burning my home and taking everything I have and running off with it. Now everyone that well, you, I thought was my friend wants to kill me. You know, forget it. I'm done. I quit. I'm throw in the towel. But that's what a lot of people might have done, but not David. One of his finer qualities was the fact that when times got tough, he took advantage of the fact that God would hear him, that he had a place he could go to boldly in his time of need and encourage himself in the Lord. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'll read on in our story here, but you're going to 1 Peter chapter, 1 Peter chapter 3, just looking at David's finer qualities. You know, we talk about his faithfulness. We talk about his loyalty. We talk about how, how fearless he was, how much faith he had in God. But, you know, this chapter shows us some other things about David, that he was a man of character. It says, so David went, you know, after he went to the Lord, he said, you know, pursue, you shall recover all. So David went, he and his 600 men that were with him, and he came to the brook Besor, where those that were left, uh, had, where those that were left stayed behind. But David pursued he and 400 men. So what's happening here is the 200 are staying behind, right? For 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. You know, it's because they're traveling back, you know, the journeying's tough enough. Then they get there and just the emotional draining impact of, of what had happened in Ziklag. You know, you know, and we say, well, what, why are they so worn out? Look, tragedy has a way of just draining us. Tough times and tribulations, I mean... When we, when we go through some emotional upheaval in our life, it is physically draining. You know, anyone who's gone through that knows that's the case. I mean, I know when, when one of our, when we did a home birth, one of our home births, like it was, it, was a, it was a tough birth. You know, we ended up having to go to the hospital. Everything turned out great, but I'm telling you, that was one of the most, I came home at the end of the day. Look, I, I hadn't given birth. <laughs> I had to do any of that physical work that my wife went through that. I mean, she was exhausted, but I'm, I'm just drained. I came home and just, I'm wiped out, you know, and, and, and why was that? Because it was a very emotionally trying day for me, you know, and we, we could all probably have experienced that to some degree or another, and there's a great example of it in the scripture. He said, what's wrong with these, these, these warriors, these 200 guys? I thought these were tough guys. Look, even they can get worn down when, when things get bad. <clears throat> and what this should show us also is that one of David's finer qualities is the fact that he had physical strength. Now, I believe all these men did, but it seems like David maybe was a little bit stronger. You know, and, and you know, of course, you know, the Bible teaches that it's more important to be strong in the Lord. You know, we're encouraged to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You know, that's very true. But we should never underestimate the importance of physical strength. 
you know, as men, you know, not, uh, this really applies to men. Don't be one of these ladies that wants to get a man's shoulders. Y you've all seen it out there, <clears throat> you know, the CrossFit chicks and everything like that, that, you know, if, if, if you didn't see, you know, if you looked at them from the right angle, you'd think that's a man, <laughs> you know, and apparently that's what's attractive nowadays <clears throat> is what I think about it. But, you know, m women should be women, you know, feminine, all that. I'm not saying women should be weak and not have strength. Look, any, any wife and mother knows that there's a certain level of physical strength that you have to have to do all the, the things that they have to do as a wife and mother, right? But I want to talk particularly to the men because of the fact that, you know, David is exhibiting the fact there that he had a physical stamina. You know, he was conditioned. He had strength. And I'm not saying we all have to be, you know, Olympic class athletes, you know, because that would make me a huge hypocrite if I said that, wouldn't it? Right? <laughs> you know, we have, but we should have some minimum level of strength. You know, we shouldn't, and it's important to preach that because today, you know, they're emphasizing weakness in, our, in, in men today. Yeah. It's something that's being lifted up and glorified to have, you know, the, the pencil neck, the scraggly arms, the, 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 the skinny, you know, the skinny jeans and things like that. They want to show that off like that's something to be proud of. And look, I know we all have to grow and, 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 and we don't all get there overnight. I mean, man, I was, I was this tall and 160 pounds until I was about 22 or 23. You want to talk about a bean pole. I mean, there was enough, there was enough, you know, the, uh, there was enough of a sail here, right, to catch the wind, but there wasn't a lot of weight. There was, you know, there was a mast, but there was no ship. And, you know, I'm just like, I'm grabbing onto things to try not to get blown away, you know, because it's just this little rail, you know. And, and people would point it out, man, you're skinny. Obviously, things have changed, <laughs> right? Things, have, you know, I've, I've gotten over that, thankfully. You know, the metabolism flips, and, and I get that. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, if we're, if we're a man, maybe we're not, you know, we're going to go to the gym and pull 600 pounds off the floor or something. I'm not saying that. But we should not be these weaklings that the world wants to lift up today and say, this is what manhood is. You know, and we should be, uh, we should, because of the fact that a man's strength is inherent you know, all men have a certain level of strength. You know, my wife, my wife will often tell my daughters, like, men are always going to be stronger than you. Like, you can pick on little Corbin now, but just remember one day he's going to be big Corbin, you know. And I remember that when my older sister came to that realization, when she called me her big little brother. You know, she'd come back to live with us when I was 15, and she'd been gone for a few years, and she's 18, and she thinks it, w it was the way it used to be. Oh, you want to go? She's like, want to go play football? Sure. Let's go play some football. You know, and I throw her the ball, and she comes running. She thinks she's just going to blow right through me, pick her up, and just body slam her. She's like, I'm done. You know, <laughs> and she realized that day that, hey, you know, the tide has turned here, right? <laughs> and what I'm saying is that men are inherently strong, you know, unless, unless they go out of the way to, you know, make themselves weak. You know, men just through living a, a godly life of being a provider, a worker, someone who goes out and, and works hard, you know, you're going to develop a certain level of strength just naturally. It's God-given. So we as men should be like David here and not, you know, uh, and, and try to, and we, we should embrace that. You know, we should embrace that physical strength. It's important. God has given it to us for a reason. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, speaking of their wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. You know, and that's not popular today. And I'm sure there's some roided up chick out there who's, who lives in a gym that might be stronger than, you know, a lot of men. You know, but that's not natural. You have to go out of your way to make that happen, okay? And, 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 and naturally, what the way things work out and God, when, when people fulfill their God-given roles is that men are stronger than women. And, and, uh, the, and the women are the weaker vessel just by nature. It doesn't make them less important. It doesn't make them less valuable. It's just the way that it is. Sure. And, and you, you, anyone who's being honest, you know, would, would admit that. You know, we're living in this gender-bending, backward society where, you know, I mean, look at all these freaks, these transgender freaks that, that you know, some, some young man wants to identify as a woman in high school and join, you know, and go over to some field and track th meet, you know, on, a, on a, a woman's field and track meet, and he smokes them all. You know, but he's a woman now, right? And then there's proof right there. And then the, these girls, even now there's even girls that are like objecting, saying this isn't fair. He's by, he, a man is just naturally stronger. Uh, you can call him a woman all day, you want, all, all day long. The physiology is a man. And it just, you know, men are stronger just inherently. It's God-given. And we shouldn't shun that. You know, we should be like David. 
be strong. Not just in the Lord, that's more important, I understand. But that's not to devalue the physical strength either. And what is that strength used for? You know, so we can get jacked and like oil ourselves up and stand in front of a group of people and flex in a Speedo? No, that's kind of faggish, all right? Just being honest. <laughs> Sit around and stare at dudes in Speedos uh, with oil. And, like, and I know some, even some saved Christians, about, they're, like, they're into that. I, every time I'm like, I don't say it to their face, but I'm like, okay, that's your thing, I guess. Like, yeah, I'm bodybuilding. Look, I'm, I, the white lifting, great. You know, the power lifting, you know, where you're fully clothed. <laughs> Where it's just about straining and grunting and you know pulling stuff off and then, okay I get it, but this whole bodybuilder culture, that's not why God made us strong, man. You know God made us strong why so that we could give honor under the weaker vessel, you know so that we could support a family so that we could protect a family. That's what it's used for. I'm gonna move along here in the story. Go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. It says there, and they, and so, you know, they leave, they go to take over, they get their stuff back, and they get there to the river, and they have to leave the 200 behind because they're so faint. And it says, they crossed over, David with the 400, and they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him, and, and, and you know, notice it doesn't say, and they immediately waterboarded him. I mean, David obviously had to have suspected this Egyptian's out of place here. And he probably knows something, right? He's probably has something to do with what just happened. I mean, just instinctually. Just, he's probably just connecting the dots, okay? We're following them. You know, obviously, there's this group of people. There, there's a path to follow. They've made a, you know, a, a bunch of footprints and kicked up a lot of dirt. They, it's obvious where they've been. And on the way to find them, they find an Egyptian. Not a coincidence. You know, but David didn't strap him to a board and put a towel over his face and start pouring water. What do you know? What do you know? You know, trying to extract information from him. He goes about it very delicately, doesn't he? It says, and they, they, they made him eat, and they, gave, man, and they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of a cake figs and two clusters of raisins. Man, this is making me hungry, right? And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, and when he had, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? Now begins, you know, the, the inquisition, the, uh, the interrogation, right? After he's taken care of him, brought him back to physical strength, nurtured him, and shown him that, you know, he's not his enemy. He's not there to just, you know, slay him, right? He wants to get information from him, and he goes about it a certain way. And he says to him, uh, he says, and he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days agone I had fell sick. And he, when we made an invasion in the south of the Ketherites and the coast that which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. You know, and, Dave, and that's when Dave was like, ah, you know, immediately just pounced on him. So he's got his man, you know, he's got a guy with information. And David said unto him, canst thou bring me unto this company? And he, swed, and he said, swear unto me that thou shalt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. Now, it doesn't explicitly say that, you know, and David kept, you know, it's implied that David kept his word because he does lead him directly to where they are. He knows where they, where they are headed. But what I want to, so what it shows us is that, you know, one of David's finer qualities is the fact that is he, he is compassionate. You know, he is not a person that is without, not without compassion. You know, even on, even on somebody that he could have considered an enemy. I mean, he said, oh, we, where are you coming from? Oh, I burned Ziklag with fire. I mean, oh, and we carried away of it. Oh, you helped out with that? You were the one that went in there and helped your master burn my house and steal my, my, my family and all the family of my men? You know, I mean, David, a lot of people would have just said, that's it, I've heard all I need to hear, and, you know, just in a rage off of his head or whatever. But David, you know, he's compassionate even to his enemy. Obviously, he's trying to gain something from him, but, you know, he could have held him down and say, okay, which toe is it first? Until, you know, which one do you, I'm going to start breaking fingers until you tell me what I want to hear. You know, and extract it, and, and you say, well, who does that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of governments, you know, a lot of even our own, you know, <laughs> through these, these strange, you know, these, these uh, black site operations where they torture people. Anyway, I'm not going to go off on that. But it shows us that David is a compassionate individual. And, you know, and, and we should be compassionate as well, you know, even to our enemies. You say, even our enemies? Well, look at Luke 23. Verse 33, it says, And when they were come to a place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, the one on, one on the right hand and the other on the left. 
Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So even when Jesus is being crucified and mocked, he's asking for, you know, he's having compassion even on the ones that are doing it to him. You know, Jesus was a very compassionate individual, obviously. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter, go over to 2 Timothy 3, but in 1 Peter 3 it says, Finally, be of all one mind, having compassion one of another. You know, it's strange when you meet somebody, a Christian, who's, who's so compassionate for the lost, people they don't even know, but then in a church they have no compassion one for another. It, it's the strangest thing to see when someone, you know, uh, gets vindictive and angry or just mad at somebody and, and, and unforgiving and so on and so forth and just it has no compassion for a fellow brother in Christ. Right. You know, and that's just human nature. And that's why even then, you know, yeah, we need to be compassionate on people that we don't know. Maybe that's why it's so much easier to be compassionate towards them because we don't know what they're really like. You know, you kind of get to round people and start rubbing shoulders. Maybe that's when we have to start to learn how to, you know, grease the wheels a little bit in the church and, and get along with one another and be civil, right? But that's why he's having to command us, you know, finally be all of one mind, have in compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, right? And look, that last part there, be courteous, that's like, that's like the minimum requirement to be able to come to church. You know, I, again, I've said it before and I'll say it again, not everybody in the room has to be friends with one another, but everybody has to be courteous. That's the rule. Amen. Civility is, all, you know, the, the minimum, Right? Meaning you should be able to shake, even if you don't like somebody, you know, and I get it, you know, we, we can be compassionate and courteous. They, we just, some people don't gel well together. They're, I just don't like so-and-so, you know, it's not somebody I'm going to want to spend time with outside of church. That's fine. I get that. But hey, at, when you come to church, how are you doing? Handshake, well, fist bump, okay? Fist bump, right? And, and a, how are you good? You know, just civility, just something you would extend to any other person on planet Earth unless you're just out to be rude to everybody you can, right? And, and that's, that's that there. You know, David is compassionate even to his own enemy. And not only that, we also see that David is one that kept his word. You know, when David gave his word, when he said, hey, show me where they are, I'll show you where they are, said the Egyptian, as long as you promise not to kill me. You don't slay me. And, you know, we don't see him slaying it. He doesn't really address it, but it's inferred that he kept his word, right? Because he, he's immediately finding them. David is a man of his word. And this is something that, you know, has kind of gone by the wayside today. You know, and I always hear the old timers talk about, oh, I remember when a handshake was all you needed. You know, the man's word was, as, was you know, as good as, as, as bond. You know, it was, it was, you know, rock solid. Now today it seems like, you know, someone could just be lying to your face in business, you know, and in all kinds of matters. And we should not be that way. You know, we should, we should ex exhibit these finer attributes that David has. And one of them is that we should be people of our word. And it says there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says, This know also, then last days perilous times shall come, for men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, pro boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, with not un un natural affection, truce, truce breakers. Say, what's a truce breaker? Somebody says, okay, yeah, truce. It's going to be peace between us. You know, they give them their word, and then they break it. All right? That wasn't David. He was not a truce breaker. And, and, and really, and I, I believe I've preached a whole sermon on this, about an end times attitude that people develop. This, we don't want to exhibit any of these. You know, you say, well, you look, I'm not, I'm not a lover. Of, I'm not covetous. I'm not a boaster. I'm not proud. I'm not a blasphemer. But are you disobedient to parents? You know, that's an end time. That's something that very wicked people do. You know, and we should never, I'm not saying if we do that or we have done that, that we're just these wicked, horrible reprobates. But you know what? We share something in common with them, don't we? Because that's how they are. And you could say any one of these, unthankful. You know, I, I'm not grateful for the things that are given to me. I'm not thankful for the things that I have. That's a bad attitude. You know, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers. You know, when you give somebody your word, they should be able to trust it. Like David. He said, hey, the Egyptians, I'll tell you where they are, just don't kill me. You got my word. You know, a guy who, you know, helped burn his own city to the ground. And, I mean, David's there because of this guy and his, and his buddies. The whole reason David has to do all this is because of guys like this Egyptian and what they did. But David, or David is even able to give him his word and say, I won't do it. Right? And we should be the same way. Go over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Continuing on in our story, it says, And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad all the earth, 
eating and drink, drink, drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken on the land of the Philistines and the land of Judah. So they, these guys are there thinking, we, the Malachites are like, we got away with it. Let's go have a party. Right? They're counting their, they're counting their chickens before, you know, how's that go? Don't count your chickens before they, before they hatch. Right? That's what they're doing. They're counting their chickens before they hatch, right? They're, ups, they're like, hey, all right, we got away with it. Uh, 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 you're getting caught right now. Verse 17, and David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. Again, going back to the stamina, the physical strength, the prowess th that he had. He smote, he, what does it say there? He smote them from the twilight. Okay, so that's when the sun is going down, the day has gone by. From, you know, twilight is in the morning and the day it's like dusk, Right? He smites them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. I mean, he's just, I mean, he's just not letting up. He has some, uh, you know, he's very bold here. And it says there, And David smote them from the twilight on the evening of the next day. There escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. So only the people that have, you know, the, all the people on foot are just wiped out. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And Devi, David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor the anything that they had taken to them. They get everything back, just like the Lord promised they would. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drave before those other cattle, and said, this is David's spoil. So not only did they get everything else, their own stuff back, but they also got everything else they had taken from other people. So not only did he recover all, they also got, he walked away with even more, right? But again, I want to point out the fact that David here has tenacity, right? He, he's, he's, he's going, he's traveling after them. Hey, we lost 200 guys. Let's keep going. It's been a long day. Let's keep going. There they are. Let's track them down. Let's fight. We're going to pursue them and destroy every single one of them and take everything back and then some, even if it takes an entire day to do it. I mean, David's got some drive. He's got some tenacity. He finishes the job. You know, we shouldn't be these people that want to just do things halfway. You know, we should always try to do things to their completion. We should try. If we start something, finish it, you know. And look, I'm just, let me confess my fault. That's an area I've, always, I've struggled in for a long time. Just being one of these people that kind of does things halfway, a little lazy, you know. And I've had to work on that and catch myself and say, hey, you said you were going to do this. You need to do it. And at least, at least give it all you got. And if it, if it doesn't work out, then you can at least say, well, I tried. I gave it all I got. You know, that's the type of people we should be like David. Someone who has some tenacity, people who have drive, people who want to get the job done. You know, be people of their word. And then when we start something, hey, I'm going to do it. We can walk away and say, well, so-and-so said he's going to do it. I know it's going to get done. That's the type of people we should be. I mean, think about the fact that God isn't going halfway with you. Do you think any of God's promises are just, well, he, I know God said that, but maybe because, you know, you know how he is. Right. No, when God says something, you know, you have his word. He's going to finish what he starts. Amen. That's what it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, God's not going to be like, yeah, I know I told you it was eternal. I said all that and that, you know, I would never leave you or forsake you. But, you know, now that you're here, I changed my mind or. You know, I, I don't feel like it now. You know, God's going to finish what he has begun. Right. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. To finish it. Not to get close. Not to just say, Nah, it's good enough. You know, somebody else can finish that up. No, he said, I came here to finish the work, to get it done. That's the type of people we got to be. Those were one of David's finer attributes that we should try to exhibit. The Lord always finishes what he began. You know, he didn't get to the fifth day and be like, oh, I'm tired now. You know, no, he finished the sixth day, sixth day and then took a rest. He finishes everything. We shouldn't go halfway in our life when we, we're given a task to do or whatever it is. And by the way, if you're a Christian, you're trying to live the Christian life, you have a task. You have a job to perform. You have work to do as a Christian. You know, and it, you know salvation's by grace. It's a free gift. It's not of works. But you know what? Christian living is work. It's a task. It's something that has to be accomplished. That takes effort. And you're going to have to be a person with some tenacity if you're going to finish the race. You know, if you're going to get to the end and, and get the victor's crown. And not be somebody who just falls out halfway through. <clears throat> we should not go halfway in living for the Lord. We should go all the way with it. 
I should have had you go to Psalms. Go to Psalms 119, verse 10. Psalms 119, verse 10. I'll read it to you from Psalms 119, verse 60. He said, David, I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. He said, when I found out what God's commandments were, I didn't, I didn't wait around to, to complete them. I made haste. I didn't delay. I got it done. I kept them. Didn't do things halfway. I mean, that is the commandment, isn't it? In Deuteronomy 6, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Now, it's not this halfway with God. God's not halfway with us. Why would we be halfway with him? I'm halfway in. Look, people that struggle the most are not the people that are all the way in. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's easy for them. I'm not saying the Christian life isn't a struggle, but the people that are committed, that are willing to go all the way with it, no matter what, thick and thin, those people have an easier time living a Christian life than the people who are half in, half out. People who don't want to get all the way in. You know, the illustration I always say is like they have one foot in the world over here, you know, not living for the Lord. And they got this other foot over here trying to live for the Lord. And that's, that, that's not even ground. And then you wonder why you're walking funny. You wonder why you're always falling and stumbling and not making the progress that other people are. It's because you're, you're, you don't have even footing. You know, and it's like either if you want to succeed in the world, you got to get it all the way over there. Or if you want to, you know, succeed in the Christian life, you got to get it all the way over here. There's no halfway in this thing. There's no halfway with God. There's no halfway with David either. He, look here in Psalms 119, verse 10. With my whole heart have I sought thee. With most of my heart, you know, I'd say about 80%. You know, uh, the majority of it, you know, no, my whole heart I have sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. That's a prayer. And look, that's a prayer that we all need to pray because that is what comes natural to us. The old man, the flesh, is, is to naturally wander away. And if we don't just constantly keep that in check, that's what's going to happen to us. We should finish what we start. We should have some tenacity. We shouldn't do things halfway because of the fact, and if you would go to Proverbs chapter 13, finish what you start because there's something said, something to be said about a job well done, right? A job well done. I mean, just apply that in so many different, just think about that practically. Let's say you like, you know, you pay somebody to build you a house and they're, and they, and they're like, look at that foundation. Isn't that great? Yeah, it's a really good foundation. Where's the rest of it? Oh, you don't need that. I didn't feel like finishing that. But look at that foundation. You know, or they, they get the foundation and the walls up and they put the drywall. They got it all framed in. No windows, no doors, no drywall. Hey, what do you think? Ready to move in? Uh, no, I paid you to finish the job. Yeah, but this is good enough. No one says, boy, he did, he did a great job. The, the part that he did was great. He didn't finish the rest of it, though. You know, if you're given a task by your, by your boss or something and you just do it halfway, even if you did a good job at what you did do, he's not going to be impressed by that. Say, hey, I, I paid, I'm paying you to do all the work, to get all of this done. And when he gets there and it's good, you know, well, I got 75% of it done and I did it really well. It looks great. And that's true. All he's going to see is the 25% that's not done. Yeah. And go, that, yeah, fin enough with that. Finish the 25%. Get it done. Don't be a person that does things halfway. You know, David, you know, he was faint. He was tired. And look, there's, there's seasons in life where we have to push ourselves, you know. And, 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 and here's the thing about that. That's not always the case, you know. But there are times when we need to redline. You know, we need to push ourselves. And things are difficult. Circumstances aren't ideal. You know, maybe we've got to stay up late. We've got to get up early, whatever it is. But we should make that happen because there's something to be said about a job that is well done. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. You know, the person who just patiently works and works and works until he gets the job done, you know, that's better than the proud in spirit who just says, well, look at what I did do. I know I didn't do everything I was supposed to do, but just look how good what I did do you know, is. It's, no, it's, it's, it's better to get something done. It's the better to get to the end of a thing, to finish the job. I mean, what would you want as an employer? Would you want a guy that just gets the whole job done to the standard, or a guy who does a really good job at what he does do, but doesn't finish the job. You'd want the other guy. You'd want the guy that says, maybe he doesn't do you know, the, the greatest work ever, but it's good, and he gets it done. That's what matters. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, where you are, the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. When it's finished, when it's done, 
Man, you ever, you ever have a hard task to do and get it done? Isn't that a good feeling? That's a great feeling. When you have some chore, some job, something to finish, and you get it done, there's a sense of accomplishment. But what about when, you, when the, there's a deadline and you don't have it done? When there's a deadline, it's like, oh, only 60% is done, only 70% is done. Look, I don't care how good that 60 or 70% is, that is one of the worst feelings in the world. Right. I mean, like, I, I can relate to it when it comes to sermon, you know, preach, preaching, sermon prep. You know, it's, it's like, what if I showed up tonight and said, well, you know, we're just going to preach through most of 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'm going to give it all I got in 1 Samuel chapter 30. You know, the, the, the bit I have here, but there's like half the chapter. I, yeah, I just didn't have time. And you'd say, this guy's a joke, you know. What's he doing? He's not fit for the job. And I could preach the greatest sermon that's ever been preached on the first, you know, 15 verses of 1 Samuel chapter 30. But if I don't finish the other 16, did I really accomplish the job here tonight? Because there is 31 chapters, I believe. Maybe my math's off. I don't know. You get my point, though, right? It's the desire accomplished when the job is done. The end of a thing that is good, that's what brings us that satisfaction. And when we don't do that, man, it's one of the worst feelings in the world, the anxiousness. Going to turn in the homework. There's a deadline. It's not done. It's not done. Oh, I, I had time. I didn't do it. It's not done. I, I hated that feeling. Not that I ever did that. <laughs> right? But we all go through that. you know. And, 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 but David, you know, one of his finer attributes was is that he finished what was given to him to do. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll, we'll wrap up here. <coughs> so David goes. He recovers all. He even gets some spoil. And it says in verse 21, he came to the, and, and David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David. So remember, now he's going back, right? Whom they also had made to abide at the, to the, uh, at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. So the 200 are coming back to meet him. And he says that he saluted them. You know, he, he greeted them. You know, I don't think it was like, it's just like, you know, that's, they salute him. It's like saying hi or greeting them. He didn't ignore them and say, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. You know, I, you know, I got your wife and kids back. You're welcome. You know, he wasn't puffed up about it. You know, David isn't puffed up here. He didn't put the 200 down, right? He didn't go to those 200 guys like, well, it would have been a lot, yeah, we made it, but it would have been a lot easier if you were there. You know, sure could have used you out there, you losers, staying behind. You know, what, what's wrong with you? Right? He doesn't look down on these guys. Because again, he's a guy who has compassion. You know, he understands you know, people, are, you know, people are, they went through a hard time. Maybe they don't have the strength they needed. Whatever. You know, he was compassionate towards them. And when he comes back, you know, he doesn't talk down to them. You know, and and he, he, he isn't puffed up. He salutes them. He has respect for them. Right? And uh, did I have you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4? I'll read to you from 1 Corinthians 4. Just, you can go back to, to 1 Samuel 30 if you want. But 1 Corinthians 4, I don't know if I had you turn it or not, but it says in verse 6, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transfigured to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might, not, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. He says in verse 7, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou did not receive? He's saying, look, if you have something, you know, don't get puffed up about it because what hast thou that thou didst not receive? You know why David didn't show up and say, yeah, you're welcome with this puffed up attitude and just look down on these guys and become arrogant? Is because before all, at the very beginning of all this, he sought the Lord. And it was the Lord that gave him the ability to go and even accomplish this. What he had, he received at the hand of the Lord. It was God that was with him through all that. And, you know, he knew that he was no different than those 200 men. It could have just as easily been him that day that had to stay behind and let other people go and, and do the hard work, right? And so David has this, this attitude of not being puffed up one against another. He's a very humble person. This is one of his finer attributes. I mean, he could have really rubbed it in their faces, couldn't he? And said, you know, look how bad we are. You know, I guess we're better than you guys. Whatever. He didn't do that. He didn't look down on him. And what also I want to point out here is that David doesn't assume the worst about people. And look, this is something we need to really get through our heads because it's really easy to become jaded with humanity, especially when you get in church and you start, 
if you're going to be faithful in church, especially when you get in the ministry, okay? It, when you start to see the type of people that write, the type of people that show up and just, look, the churches attract the best and worst people there are in the world. That's not an exaggeration. It'll a- attract you know, people who love God, want to be sold out to God, want to serve the Lord, just love the Lord, love His Word, love church. Those are great people, and we have a lot of that, but you know, and, and those are the best people in the world. But there's also the worst type of people in the world that come to churches. And they're just there to infiltrate, to divide, to, to, to wreak havoc, to hurt, to just do whatever they can to harm the body of Christ. I mean, literal psychopaths. People, those are the type of people that come to churches. Because here's the thing, they, a lot of times the people like that, especially reprobates, are attracted to that, to, to, they want to go to a church and fit in, not because they love God, but because they know what they really are. Even if they can't explain it, even if it's just on a subconscious level, they know what they really are, reprobate. And, come, if, and they just think, well, if I just can start going to church and get around home, home, uh, wholesome people and try to emulate them and live a wholesome life, you know, it's cathartic to them. You know, it's, it, to them, it's like, it's like a soothing of the, you know, the wound. It's like, a, you know what I mean? But eventually their true colors come through and they, 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 they show their fangs eventually. But, and and I, so I say all that to, to remind us that even though that is the case, that we cannot assume the worst about people. We should always give people the benefit of the doubt until they just make it glaringly obvious that they are what they are. And then, you know, then it's, that's another story. But you say, well, do people really sneak in? Would people really try to infiltrate? Would, so, you know, would, would uh, you know, these reprobates really try to get into, a, into amongst God's people? Look at verse 22. It says, Then answered all the wicked men and the men of Belial, of those that went with David. These are guys that are with David. They are in the number of the 400 that went with him. These are the guys that have been with David the entire time since, since they came to him in the wilderness after he fled from Saul. That's who this is. And it's not, it's not David saying this. Okay, again, who is telling us that it, they are sons of Belial? The narrator of the story, the scripture itself, the Holy Spirit is the one that's telling us. So this isn't just, oh, somebody you know, wrote that and they, that's how they perceived it. It's kind of a thing. No, the Bible is explicitly telling us that these were, men, these were infiltrators. They were men of Belial, which are you know, literal me- devil worshipers. They are reprobates. They don't follow the Lord. They don't love God. And you can see it in their attitude. <clears throat> and they're with who? David. So yeah, there's a perfect example of wicked people infiltrating and hanging out and going along with and, and playing the part even going to fighting God, David's enemies. They'll fight right alongside you. And then, you know, and eventually, you know, they, they out themselves. But David didn't know it. I mean, David said in verse 23, ye shall not do so, my brethren. He's calling them brothers. He's like, David is thinking, he's got him fooled. He doesn't know what they really are. He says, and what would they want? They said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered. And then they say, save to every man his wife and his children, they may lead them away and depart. But you know, the stuff that was taken, we're not going to give them back their things. We're not going to give them back the, the gold, the silver, whatever was taken from them, the, the cattle, the possessions. We're going to keep that. You know, and I don't have time to develop it, but that just goes to show you, just like we read, that they are covetous, right? Perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves, right? And one of the attributes is listed is that they shall be covetous that they're going to want more than they need, that they're going to want other people's things and they'll take it and they'll, and they'll be liars and so on and so forth. So that we could see that attribute there. But David, you know, he just, he doesn't assume the worst about people. He's just thinking, boy, that, that's not a good thing. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't want to, you need to give them back all their stuff. But he doesn't say, I wonder if those guys are sons of Belial. I bet you those guys are a bunch of reprobates for even having said something like that. No, he says, my brethren, you know, he's assuming the best. You shall not do so, my brethren, with that, uh, <clears throat> with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came uh, against us into our, our, our hand. So the Bible identifies these guys as sons of Belial, reprobates, but David calls them brethren. And the, one, of the other, one of the last attributes we can learn from David is not only does he not assume the worst about people, is that David isn't covetous. He says, look, verse 24, for who will hearken to you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff they shall partake. They shall part alike. And David, David could have easily at this point said, you know what? You're right. 
and everyone would have gone probably, I mean, the 200 probably would have piped up and said, well, that's not fair, but what, what's 200 going to do against four of David? Nothing. And he could have just easily said, yeah, you're right. We will keep it. You're right. These guys don't deserve it. We did all the hard work today. But David's not a covetous person. You know, and, and for sake of time, I'll just go ahead and, and, and bring it up. At the end, the closing verses, it says how he gave to this family and this family and these people back in the land of Judah. You know, that, he wasn't even there. He'd been chased out of Judah. And he's giving it to all those, the, his brethren that are back in his homeland. The spoil that he had taken, the, the, you know, above what he had recovered, he was given that additional spoil. The Bible says he gave it away at the end. He's not a covetous man. You know, and we shouldn't be covetous people either. You know, the, the, Jesus said, take heed. And, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of his possessions. Life is not about how many toys you can collect. You know, the life is more than, 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 than raiment and the body more than meat. I got that backwards. But it's telling us, look, there's more to life than just things and stuff. You know, what, the things that really matter in life are our relationships with others and with the Lord and serving God and so on and so forth. David's not a covetous individual. That's why he was a, it was just easy come, easy go for him. You know, he was ready to just kiss it all goodbye. <clears throat> Not only that, last thing I'm going to point about David's finer attributes, and we lucked a, a lot of them. I won't take the time to rehearse all of them again, but is the fact that David cared about future generations. You know, it wasn't one of these people that was just like, you know, as long as it's, it's peace in my days, you know, I don't care what happens to the next generation. He's forward thinking. He's thinking, and, and you know, we have to think this way. You know, we have to think about the next generation. We had to think about teaching them and instructing them and, 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 and inspiring them and moving them to, because to, look, we're not going to be here forever. Who's going to stand in the gap once we're gone? You know, the next generation has to come up. And, uh, you know, we've got to think about in that sense, but we also have to think about the fact that we don't want to harm the next generation. And David, you know, he says there in verse 25, and it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and ordinance for Israel unto this day. And what was the ordinance? That, you know, if, if a group of people are pursuing an enemy and some of them become so faint that they can no longer go on, they still get to have part in the spoil. You can't take what was theirs. If you're successful, you have to give it back. He said, this is a law to keep these, you know, keep these children of Beal from doing what they want to do, which is just take what doesn't belong to them. <coughs> so he's thinking about the future generations, isn't he? He's saying, I'm a, you know, I care so much about the, not only the, the 200 that are here with me today, but I care about anybody else that's in a similar situation for years to come. He's forward thinking. He's thinking about the next generation. You know, so I hope, you know, that, that at least if we're, we could take something from this chapter, at least one of David's, you know, many attributes, we could probably find a lot more about him. We could talk a lot about him. He's a great man of God. But there's a lot of things here that we could apply to our lives. David's finer attributes. And, uh, you know, one of the great things about David is that, you know, the, the other kind of moral in the story is the fact that, you know, he recovered all, right? Something had gone horribly wrong in his life, you know, and, and, and he wanted to do something about it, right? And he was able to do that. And, and he was able to recover all and, and then some. And look, if you want to kind of get back the wasted years, you want to get back, you know, what's been lost, if we're backslidden, if, you know, uh, we're, we're late to serving the Lord in, in life or, you know, we just whatever, we want to make up lost time, what's been lost, you can recover all of that. You really can. You can do more exploits in your latter years than in your, in your former. But you have to be willing to exhibit these same attributes. You can't just want it. You've got to have the same type of character that David had, humility, not being covetous, not being greedy, not uh, being puffed up, not you know, just assuming the worst about everybody having some strength, having some tenacity, having some character, having some drive, you know, and a willingness to, to put yourself out there. I think there's a lot of great attributes that we can learn uh, from David, his finer attributes. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.